we had to be willing to be the bad guy in order to get us across the finish line. Welcome to The Craft of Campaigns. I'm your host, Andrew Willis Garces. In this podcast, we go behind the headlines and hashtags, inviting movement storytellers to share lessons from social justice campaigns. Campaigns are a series of collective actions focused on winning a concrete demand beyond one-off mobilizations or election cycles. They have villains and heroes, teams that make plans to win, and activate people on the sidelines. In each episode, we explore one campaign through firsthand interviews for key lessons, principles, and practices for organizers today. In this episode, we hear another story of a group of organizers fed up with a lack of progress by the advocates who said they were trying to change an urgent problem and who decide a more disruptive strategy is needed to shift the pillars of support holding up the status quo. In this case, we'll hear about queer organizers who saw a window closing to force President Obama to fulfill even one of his campaign promises, ending Don't Ask, Don't Tell, with progressive lobbyists in DC counseling patients and support for Obama's go slow approach. And we'll hear about how they switched between campaign demands of Senate Democratic leaders during the summer of 2010 with midterm elections looming, including characters familiar to those of us following the drama in 2022, like Joe Manchin. Just a note, when Training for Change's Organizing Skills Institute team set out to produce this podcast, we wanted to amplify the stories of campaigns that felt especially relevant to this moment. It may feel to those of you who have heard at least a few episodes that we also meant to chronicle stories like this one of disruptive new organizations that might have only come together for the purpose of winning a single campaign. But that wasn't intentional. It just so happens many of the best stories relevant for today of groups that unleash people power on specific targets to win a demand over an action sequence that we would call a campaign were not just interventions on the pillars of support maintaining a harmful status quo, they were also interventions on an existing movement ecosystem. I think it's indicative of a reality that if you look around for campaigns that get stuck or problems that you think we should have solved through organized people power by now, chances are you'll find a movement ecosystem that isn't quite in balance. Although there are a bunch of different ways to understand what makes up a movement ecosystem, One of the frameworks we've adopted is the idea that there are four primary roles we play in campaigning for social change, which was originated by strategist Bill Moyers. It's often hard to win campaigns or advance movement goals without multiple organizations each playing a different role, activating a separate point of leverage and playing their role effectively. There's a link in our show notes that explains what we mean when we refer to playing a given role effectively or ineffectively. In today's episode, We'll hear about the organizations playing advocate roles, trying to use the established channels to change a policy with professional lobbyists attempting to move specific lawmakers or executive branch staff. And we'll hear about the rebel organization that formed in response to the failure of the strategies they were using to put more heat on the Obama administration to move faster. We won't hear about them, but there were surely organizations playing helper roles too, like a queer mental health counseling clinic where I once worked which supported LGBTQ service members wrestling with how to manage the military's don't ask, don't tell policy and how it affected them personally. And there might have been others playing organizer roles, like Southerners on New Ground did in episode four, bringing queer people together to build momentum around their shared values and shared interests. In this case, Get Equal, the rebel organization, brought together out service members, but not to build bigger and bigger long-term coalitions. Rather, it was so they could participate in disruptive direct actions that would dramatize the harm of the military's homophobic policies and make it more difficult for policymakers to keep not doing anything about it. That's the hallmark of a rebel group. And in this case, it's pretty clear that without their dramatic interventions, there would have been little awareness in 2020 about how the administration's policy was creating harm and of don't ask, don't tell being an urgent issue, even if, as Heather admits, it still wasn't enough to activate a large enough segment of the public at large. She also points out that the campaign would have been much stronger if the well-connected advocates with inside game muscle had been willing to work with the new rebel formation, with each playing to their strengths. 
You'll hear examples of productive collaboration between rebels and advocates in episode one, which takes place one year after this episode in roughly the same organizing terrain, with some of the same undocumented organizers Heather shouts out in this interview. And in episode five, in which the DEC Collective was able to cultivate a group of advocates working alongside rebels within the organization. And in episode eight, with Casino Free Philadelphia rotating between disruptive rebel actions and working to leverage rulemaking authority and the courts, their advocacy toolbox, while also serving as a new organizing hub, bringing together different sets of people to build a long-term movement to stop casinos. As always, if you want stories like this one to be recommended to more organizers, scanning their Spotify, YouTube, and Apple podcast feeds, drop us a rating and a recommendation. Heather Kronk is a community organizer with experience working with LGBTQ liberation, immigrant solidarity, and racial justice movements. As managing director of Care in Action, she supports the work of the National Domestic Workers Alliance to translate people power into political impact for and with domestic workers. Prior to joining Care in Action, she served as co-director of Showing Up for Racial Justice, focused on organizing white people to undermine white supremacy, and previously served as co-director of Get Equal and Chief Operating Officer for the New Organizing Institute. Heather Kronk, thank you so much for being here with us on The Craft of Campaigns. Thanks, Andrew. I'm excited for the conversation. Me too. So if this campaign was a movie, can you give us the trailer of the three acts that we're going to see? What's coming? Yeah, I think the Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal campaign happened over over three periods. One would be the founding of this country to Don't Ask, Don't Tell being instituted in the 90s. The second act would be the effort to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So that would be about 93 until 2009. And then once Barack Obama was elected president, then the the dynamics around repeal really shifted. And so you have 2009 through the very, very end of, of 2010, where we had a, a Hail Mary strategy. Hail Mary. All right. So we got some football passes coming. Great. It'll be a movie. It'll be a Super Bowl. Awesome. Can you tell us as we get started, just a little bit about who you are and your connection to this story? I grew up mostly in Kentucky, moved around a lot. My mom was a preschool teacher. My dad served in the army and then worked as a civilian for the army. And so we moved around a bit, but I grew up all over the Southeast and spent most of my childhood and middle school, high school, even into college years, I'm an evangelical fundamentalist Christian, which really shaped a lot of who I was and who I am, and also shapes a lot of my organizing, my day-to-day -day organizing and how I think about campaigns and how I think about winning people over primarily through story. And so fast forward a lot of years. After college, I went into seminary and I started seminary straight and Methodist. And I graduated from seminary queer and agnostic, which is not uncommon for people who go to, to seminary or divinity school, but really came out of that experience wanting to, wanting to create change, wanting to do that toward a progressive vision and found organizing shortly after graduating seminary. Maybe just bring us up to the present. What's your primary political work or connection to campaigning? So following seminary, I was really struggling to figure out how I wanted to move in the world. Most people who I graduated with went into church ministry, went into PhD programs, went into hospital chaplaincy. None of those felt like the right fit. And ended up sort of falling into organizing which made a ton of sense with the way that I had been brought up. I was like, oh, right. I understand how to um, get people to, to articulate their stakes in an issue. I understand how to get people to tell their story. This makes a lot of sense. And so since then, I've moved through different nonprofit and organizing work, including the work that we're going to talk about today with an organization called Get Equal. And currently I work with the National Domestic Workers Alliance, 
which is a C3 membership organization of domestic workers across the country, which includes house cleaners, nannies, and home health care aides. Cool. And as far as your connection to this particular campaign, this story, so you came out in seminary, but didn't join the military, but were an activist. And so I'm curious about how you got interested in overturning Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which was this policy that kept queer people from serving openly in the military, and also how you see it as part of this bigger struggle for equality, for fighting for equal rights for queer and trans people in this country. And I think your sense is this goes back hundreds of years. So can you help set that up for us? Sure. My queer identity hadn't really been radicalized until actually until 2009, 2010, I was politicized by the immigrant rights movement. When I started seeing um, queer and trans and documented young people who were taking extraordinarily courageous steps in order to fight for their own dignity and respect. And it's when I started making that connection, my ideology had already been politicized, but my queer identity hadn't been politicized. And so that's when I started looking at, you know, where are there opportunities for me to organize explicitly out of my queer identity and found Get Equal. And then the reason why I was really compelled by the idea of, of working to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell is partially because queer and trans people have been part of the U.S. military since the American Revolution. There was literally a soldier who was kicked out by George Washington for sodomy. So this has been a really long story. I was partially compelled by queer and trans people being mistreated, being seen as less than, being treated in really inhumane ways. But I was I was partially also compelled by Don't Ask, Don't Tell Repeal as a campaign, because I had looked at the civil rights movement and seen, you know, most people think about the start of the civil rights movement as bus boycotts, which there is an argument to be made about that. But it was actually the integration of the military that provided the fuel to the fire in thinking about how how the movement was shifting the culture. It's really hard to tell someone who is serving in your military that they can't have the same rights as everyone else. And that's what a lot of folks in in the civil rights movement experienced when they came back from Korea, when they came back from World War II. They had experienced, I won't won't say equality, but they experienced some degree of, of freedom in other countries and then came back to their own and were like, whoa, this is this is going to take some adjusting. So I saw Don't Ask, Don't Tell Repeal as a pathway for much more liberatory work. And what were some of the other things you all were hoping or you were inspired by that were like, so we win Don't Ask, Don't Tell Repeal, then we win this, then we, what else is the liberatory spectrum? Yeah, so from the beginning of, of Get Equal's existence, we were talking about full federal equality. We weren't launching only talking about one campaign or one policy that we wanted to overturn. We were talking about full federal equality. That was not a conversation inside the LGBTQ movement at the time. In fact, when I went and talked with other organizations about what is the legislative pathway to this, I was immediately shut down, that it was too hard. It was not possible. So we were seeing Don't Ask, Don't Tell Repeal as a pathway to winning employment non-discrimination as a pathway to making sure that queer and trans kids have equal access to education. There's a whole host of other things that we were hoping this would unlock. And we actually launched our Don't Ask, Don't Tell Repeal campaign on the same day that we launched a campaign for the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. We were actually taking action on both policies at the same time in 2010. What did the Employment Non-Discrimination Act have done? It is still not law, (laughs) but it would have made it illegal across the country, regardless of what state you live in, 
to fire someone explicitly because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Um, so that is still not the law. There are many states across the country that have statewide laws, but there is no federal law banning employment discrimination. So you were telling us about how queer people have been kicked out of the military for a long time. And Don't Ask, Don't Tell actually is only around since 1992. Can you give us a sense of what was happening leading up to that? And, and then sort of after that, what life is like for queer and trans people in the military and why, therefore, there was a movement to repeal it starting the day it was passed in 1992? Sure. Yeah, so... When Don't Ask, Don't Tell was first instituted, it was a compromise. That was a time when Bill Clinton was in the White House, um, but Republicans were st- starting to really gain a lot of political power. That was when Newt Gingrich was, was basically running Congress. And when the, the religious right, the moral majority were really on the rise in political power, the religious right had wanted to institute a much, much harsher ban. And Clinton's compromise was, look, if there are gay people in the military, as long as they don't talk about it, then let's, let's call it even. Let's say it's fine. That was the don't tell part. The don't ask part was that commanders were also not supposed to ask anyone if they were queer or trans. That policy was a bust from the start. It was very unevenly enacted. So a lot of officers, a lot of commanders, a lot of folks in authority were explicitly asking. They were trying to root queer and trans people out of the military. And that then came with a dishonorable discharge. So it would really ruin someone's life. And it, in fact, did ruin lots of people's lives if you were actually asked. The other piece of that is that that made life a nightmare for queer and trans people who had already been in the military and who were then constantly looking over their shoulder, weren't sure who they could trust, didn't know if their email was being hacked. It was like there were lots of attempts to find queer and trans people rather than letting folks coexist. Well, and presumably this is happening for decades leading up to 1992. Why in 1992 then do you need a compromise? Who's pushing from the left to change the status quo? No one was pushing from the left to change the status quo. I think the idea was if we put this don't ask, don't tell, just don't talk about it, just avoid the topic policy in place, then people who have experienced witch hunts will no longer experience those witch hunts. And that was just blatantly not true. That's not what happened. But so there were these witch hunts were in the public eye? Yeah, they were not in the public eye until after Don't Ask, Don't Tell went into place. That's when people started coming forward. Very few people who were active duty, but people who had already been discharged, people who had retired, started coming forward and saying, look, this was my experience. This policy is not working. And that's when, you know, there was a 20 year period where there was an effort to educate the public to say, this is actually hurting the military, not helping the military. But that was at a time when, you know, it was before Ellen, it was before Will and Grace, like most LGBTQ people were in the closet across the American public. So there were very brave people who were coming forward, Leonard Matlovich, Tanya Domi, many people who were willing to go public saying, this was my experience. The public was actually not ready to deal with that, not ready to hear that, didn't know what to do with that. And so Don't Ask, Don't Tell was actually very okay with the American public because the rest of society also had a Don't Ask, Don't Tell de facto policy. Right. And so during that time, it's just one of the many fronts that LGBTQ people are fighting for more rights, protections, whether that's AIDS activists, Mm -hmm. whether that's the the very well-known marriage equality movement eventually, and right, so all these different things. And so, and one thing you were telling me was, and so a lot of activists, a lot of LGBTQ activists or advocacy organizations 
in 2008 get mobilized around supporting Barack Obama's candidacy, thinking we can make a lot happen if there's a champion of ours in the White House, including people advocating repeal. So can you take us into what that moment's like and the expectations are coming into his first term? That's right. Yeah. So as we move through 2007, through the Democratic primary, Barack Obama emerges as the Democratic nominee in 2008 and then wins a huge historic election. That election was happening at the same time that Prop 8 was moving in California. There was a short window of time when marriage equality was the law of the land in California and Prop 8 was a ballot initiative that reversed that policy, reversed that opportunity. So on the same night that Barack Obama was elected, Prop 8 passed, which meant that a majority of California voters said no to marriage equality. Now, we elected a president who was also saying no to marriage equality. (laughs) Remember that he didn't come out for marriage equality until I think 2012. I was actually in California on election day 2008 because I had been doing some GOTV work around Prop 8. And I also like was super happy that Obama got elected. I was really excited about this young guy who seemed to be espousing a progressivism that we hadn't heard in a while, had a lot of energy and was energizing a lot of voters. And the internal difficulty of balancing this historic election with this equally historic and heartbreaking loss was was hard. And so the the community, the movement was coming out of a really tough Prop 8 loss and really looking toward this hope and change candidate to bring us out of that, to change policies, to be a hero and a, and a champion in the White House and to help move Congress to really get some important things done. And our movement organizations had also set that expectation, right? Our movement organizations had been very heavily backing Obama's candidacy. The whole ecosystem was saying, this is our guy. This is the guy who is going to help institute a new tomorrow and is going to help lead us out of the heartbreak of Prop 8. And then when he was sworn into office into 2009, you know, the entirety of 2009, rightfully and thankfully, was taken up by the Affordable Care Act. But Obama really spent all of his political capital on that, or or at least thought that he had, and was not making any moves at all, you know, midway into, into 2009 to do anything else on progressive policy, especially on LGBTQ policy. Probably you'll come back to this, but just to say... For those who weren't as deeply embedded in it in 2008 as you were, or I was living in D.C. at the time, but when you say movement organizations were saying he was our guy, that was really different than the approach with Biden, for instance, where most of us said it's in our interest that he get elected and we're going to help make that happen. But we have no illusions about, is he our guy? Is he really going to champion the policies that we need? urgently. Whereas with Obama, there was more of an expectation that he would, even though that's not necessarily weren't the receipts that we had on him. And so going into 2009, you were telling me that mainstream LGBTQ organizations based in DC have basically binders full of policies that he could enact, one of which is a repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and start getting invited to meetings at the White House. And so then they just kind of happen, right, Heather? What happens? Yeah, I don't know that organizations started getting invited to the White House in 2009, but they did have binders full of policies, like literal, I've seen the binder full of policies, which was good. It was good for movement organizations to say, look, here are all the things we need. Here are all of the ways that queer and trans people are unequal in this country. Here are the things that you could do via executive order. Here are the things you could do via Congress or that you could help do via Congress. And those were just sort of set to the side. It didn't seem like those actually got much engagement from the White House. 
folks in the community started getting restless. We just elected this candidate of hope and change who we th both thought and were told was going to be this champion in the White House, and we we're actually seeing nothing. And so that was what led to organizing the National Equality March in 2009. That was in the fall of 2009. And I didn't play a role in that. That was before my time. But the grassroots energy of being really pretty frustrated was channeled into this march. Um, the White House found out that the march was happening, or we're told, and very quickly moved to sign a hate crimes bill that they thought, okay, we're going to sign this hate crimes bill. <laughs> uh, we're going to make it you know, illegal to, to target someone because they're LGBTQ. That'll get rid of this really annoying part of the progressive movement that's giving us a lot of grief right now. And that was not actually what, what happened. Some parts of the community were actually angered by that to say like, this is literally the least you could do. This wasn't even a thing. It was mildly on the community's radar, but it wasn't even a thing that we were really asking for. Not targeting us is not the bar that we had set for this president. So Obama, or his aides in the White House, hastily arranged for him to speak at the Human Rights Campaign National Dinner right before the National Equality March as a way of saying, no, 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 I got you. I, I'm, I'm with you. I'll, I'll even show up at dinner with gay people. And again, thought that would quiet everyone down. And instead, it actually opened him up as someone who, you know, could be agitated, someone who clearly cared about his reputation with, with the LGBTQ community. For organizers, that actually said, great, we have a target who, who, is, who is open to being agitated, open to criticism. Great, let's go criticize and let's go get something. Cool. And can you set the stage? You mentioned the human rights campaign, but at this point, when you say organizers or organizations, who now is setting the agenda or setting the table or deciding whether or not to agitate or what the priorities are to move people on? Yeah. So in 2009, there was actually a, a pretty big, pretty vibrant EQ nonprofit ecosystem. Human rights campaign was and continues to be the largest of those and a, and a pretty moderate middle of the road kind of beltway focused organization. There were also larger organization, grassroots organizations like the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. And then a lot of more specific organizations, National Center for Transgender Equality and, and many others. There were and are so many LGBTQ people who are not part of those organizations, who are not organized. And, and so while there was a big ecosystem with actually a lot of money, a lot of resources, they weren't talking to most of the community. They were talking to a very small slice of the community. And so the folks who actually started Get Equal, Robin McGeehee and Kip Williams, as organizers were just like, there are a whole lot more people out there who are not organized and mostly who we're hearing are not happy. Let's go find a way to absorb those people into an outside agitational organizing force that at best could complement inside organizing or inside lobbying efforts and at worst provide an alternative, an agitational alternative. So they said there's a lot of people who aren't being organized. Let's go out and organize them. It wasn't necessarily the people running the inside game or have the most the closest connections to the administration are totally corrupt or just doing that really wrong. But as much as there's a gap to fill in the ecosystem, let's figure out how to do that. And also it sounds like there's this real sharp analysis about he can be pushed in a way that we're not pushing him. That's what you mean by agitational or agitated? That's a great question. A couple of things on that. One is on the pushing, President Obama literally said when he showed up to the HRC dinner, 
you got to push me, you got to make me do these things. He actually invited the agitation. And then the other piece is there were a lot of folks who were working for what I'd call mainstream LGBTQ organizations who were pretty far away from the impact of either discriminatory policies or the lack of policies. And so you had folks who were career lobbyists who live in DC, who could move around in public spaces, not feeling like they had to look over their shoulder, who just had a different level of urgency, or I'd say maybe no urgency at all. And were much more oriented toward, do I get invited to the next meeting? Do I hold on to this relationship with a moderate senator? Can I get a meeting with the Senate Armed Services Committee in five years when I have a different lobbying client? And those are the folks who were making a lot of strategic decisions for the community, many of whom were not even queer, many of whom were straight lobbyists who were then going back and saying, we don't think you should push on this. The White House is getting really, their, their feathers are getting ruffled. We're going to lose relationships. And then uh, on the other hand, you had all these people who were unorganized, who were pretty impatient, who were experiencing the harm of discrimination and targeting every day, not only folks in the military, but including folks in the military. I often get the question of like, why did y'all, you know, go after Don't Ask, Don't Tell, repeal? Why would you work on behalf of queer people who are supporting the U.S. military, who are pro-military. And as I got to know folks across the country who were falling into this unorganized, frustrated set of people, queer and trans folks enter the military for a lot of the same reasons that straight people do, right? They're trying to get out of their small town or they're trying to get money for college. They're poor, they're working class. They were kicked out of their home and they don't have anywhere else to go. So there are actually a lot of working class queer and trans people who had either gone into the military knowing they were queer or trans and just hoping that that was a better situation than living on the streets or people who came out while they were in the military and were like, shoot, the whole life that I had envisioned for myself is now gone. Forget Equal as an organization, but also for me, this was an economic justice issue that, you know, there were a lot of people who were making decisions on behalf of the movement in DC who were so far away from the economic implications or the social implications of the movement strategy. Totally. And it makes me think of when I lived in Texas, I met a bunch of openly trans people in the military who were raised working class, very working class backgrounds, and felt super accepted in the military by their military community or chosen family. And it really changed my perspective on that as a phenomenon, as an institution, as a place where some people find belonging, where they don't find belonging anywhere else. So Get Equal gets founded at the end of 2009, beginning of 2010, with all of this happening and feeling very urgent about there are real problems that our people really urgently need addressed, and the president has the power to do that. How do y'all land Don't Ask, Don't Tell? How did you announce yourselves and get going in, in trying to win that or make progress on that campaign? So Get Equal got started at basically the beginning of 2010 and actually is in the same position that we're in right now. We were in a midterm following a Democratic president being elected. Historical precedent shows that, you know, the the party that's in the White House gets real beaten up in the midterms following that election. And so in 2010, we knew there's a window that's closing. We have a sense of urgency existentially. We also have a sense of urgency politically because there is actually a clock that's winding down. Um, that was also when the Tea Party was rising in their influence and their power. And it was pretty clear that we weren't going to have a lot of opportunity to move federal legislation once we got past the midterm elections. And so it took, it took a couple of months of thinking, consulting, talking with this building group of people across the country who had 
gotten agitated and inspired and found a voice, found a political voice through the National Equality March. And so we started talking with that group of people about what, you know, what should be next? What, what should we, like, as we launch, what should be our top priorities? And actually the two that folks were most passionate about were Don't Ask, Don't Tell Repeal and also passing the Employment Non-Discrimination Act. And so rather than choosing one of those two, we were like, well, look, we have a clock that's winding down. Let's go for everything. The logic of choosing one is DC Beltway logic. We don't need to do that. And so the day that we launched, we actually held a sit-in in San Francisco in Nancy Pelosi's office, calling on her to bring ENDA to a vote. We held a sit-in in her DC office, asking her to bring ENDA for a vote. And we did our first White House arrestable action over Don't Ask, Don't Tell Repeal. There was a lot of things that were being orchestrated. The interesting piece of the Don't Ask, Don't Tell action that day was that it was actually a follow-on to HRC's, HRC held a rally, the Human Rights Campaign, held a rally in D.C. for Don't Ask, Don't Tell Repeal that featured Kathy Griffin as an episode for her show, My Life on the D-List. Just think for a second about the largest LGBTQ organization in the country has the opportunity to move federal legislation with a Democratic president and a Democratic House and Senate, and it's providing the backdrop for a celebrity's reality show. This is our Don't Ask, Don't Tell Repeal rally. And so Dan Choi, who had been kicked out of the military for being gay, an Arabic linguist, had been kicked out of the military, and he decided to disrupt that rally. And can I just say for the listeners who may not know Lieutenant Dan Choi's name, someone who was kicked out after coming out on the Rachel Maddow show a year earlier in 2009, a nationally known gay person who had been kicked out and had been very publicly about about, like about when he was kicked out. And so he had become kind of the face of the harm of this policy, is my understanding. That's right. And, and I think, you know, he really thought, I'm going to take this big risk. I'm going to come out on national television. That's a big risk to me. He was subsequently kicked out. That's what it's going to take to really get things in gear, right? I'm going to take this action and then the movement is going to have my back. And then this president who said he had my back is going to have my back and we're going to get repeal done. And that's not what happened. And so Dan was pretty upset that even taking that big of a risk was not moving the levers that it needed to move in DC. And so he basically organized the crowd who was on Freedom Plaza for that rally to march the four blocks over to the White House. And he and fellow veteran who had been kicked out, Jim Peter Angelo, hand, handcuffed them, cuffed themselves to the White House fence. And that was kind of the kickoff to that more agitational Don't Ask, Don't Tell campaign. Because then they get some national news coverage Right. I think you're going to tell us about how it, it starts to become even higher volume. But I just, I have to point out here, we're interviewing Nadia Dominguez about the immigrant rights movement, undocumented youth movement winning DACA at the same time. And it's really striking to me that this tactic basically of coming out, which the undocumented queer movement, people will, will say, no, we got inspired by LGBTQ movement. That whole tradition of coming out, coming out of the shadows was what they ended up calling it. But the fact that Lieutenant Dan Choi came out on national television, daring Obama to follow through on his promises, same with immigrants with no protection from deportation, daring congressional leadership. So this was a thing that was in the movement ecosystem where it was kind of mutually reinforcing and the media, the reporters were also more willing to pick up on because it was a thing 
that was happening. There was also this narrative, this dramatic storyline of, will he follow through? Will he live up to what he says he does or not? In some ways, different than the moment we're in now, where we have someone in the White House who hasn't actually promised that many things. So it is a little hard to make the same kind of tactical escalation, but you have this action, a bunch of people get arrested and I think they do it again at the White House fence. And then where does Get Equal go from there to keep turning up the heat? Within about three months from our launch, it became really clear that Endo was not going to move. There were no hearings really happening uh, about it. Barney Frank, who was a longtime member of Congress and the first openly gay, although not by his decision, member of Congress, was actually running interference on ENDA, was being actively not helpful. And the bill was getting amended to put religious exemptions in it. It didn't have the viability that we had hoped for. So we really shifted our attention in a personally upsetting way. To this day, I still don't know whether that was the right decision. But we shifted our attention to Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal. Again, we were losing time because we knew that Democrats were going to lose Congress in the midterms. That was very clear by the summer. So we focused on Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal and literally just followed the legislative process around D.C. So there were several instances where we had people arrested at the White House fence because we knew that that would get attention. The backdrop was Obama's house, right? It was like going to a, a corporate target's house and doing, doing an action there. So we knew that that would get attention, but we also knew that we had to continue to escalate that tactic or it would get stale and no one would cover it anymore. So the second time that we had people arrested at the White House fence, it was more people. I think that one was six people representing all branches of the military and in uniform, making sure that we were representing all branches and having people arrested in uniform were both escalation tactics. I got calls from other LGBTQ movement organizations begging us not to get people arrested in uniform. To them, it felt disrespectful. It would have backlash. And to us, it was like, this is the way that we create cognitive dissonance for the American public. If you see people in uniform being led away from the White House in handcuffs, you have to ask a question about that. And so we did that a couple of times. We also followed the legislative process around. We knew that there was going to be a hearing about Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal in the Senate Armed Services Committee. John McCain was the ranking minority member of that committee, military hero, longtime career, has kids in the military. One of them was rumored to be gay. Still don't know whether that's true. And he and Lindsey Graham were the primary Republicans who were blocking the repeal effort. And so we had people go to a Senate Armed Services Committee hearing. Democrats were in the majority, so it was being run by Democrats. And we stood up, we had folks sit on the front row um, of the public part of the hearing room. And at one point during the hearing, we had folks stand up and they had pictures from the civil rights movement. One of the posters said, what will your legacy be, Senator McCain? Trying to create this dramatic moment where he had to make a choice. He was being confronted with what his potential legacy might be. We know that he wasn't going to get that message through his staff or through the media, you know, senators are very, very sheltered. But if we could confront this primary blocker and ask him this really pointed question, we thought that might have an impact. We also went to, there were a couple of Democrats who voted against including Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal in the National Defense Authorization Act, which was the primary strategy that the movement had been using for repeal. We knew that those Democrats were going to continue to be a problem if we could get a straight up vote on repeal. One of them was Jim Webb, who is a veteran, and his son was, I think, active duty at the time. He was the senator from Virginia, and he had made this point of telling the story on the campaign trail about his son before he was shipping off or something, giving him a pair of, of, his, own, of his boots. The boots were this symbolic thing to Senator Webb. 
And so we had a couple of gay veterans who had been kicked out of the military, all write messages. We found a pair of boots, all write messages to the senator on the boots, and then deliver those boots to his office and talk with his staff about their own stories. So we were trying to follow the legislative process and intervene in it as much as possible, whether that's confronting senators face to face or confronting the American public. What I'm getting is also, so McCain is a primary villain opposing Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal. The Republicans are not in leadership, so he doesn't actually control the committee. He's just a strong voice opposed. So was the, the plan was to try to get all of the Democrats to vote to include Don't Ask, Don't Tell in the military budget bill, basically. So who were you trying to persuade and who are you trying to activate behind them to move them? So the primary legislative strategy was to get repeal included in the NDAA. And that's a bill that basically has to pass every year. And so everyone uses it as vehicles for whatever they want. So we were trying to get repeal included in NDAA. That vote happened in September of 2010, again, a month and a half before midterm elections. And I think it was Jim Webb and I think Joe Manchin voted against it. And when that happened, we knew we don't have all the Democrats. And we needed all the Democrats in order to get the bill through. So then the only legislative vehicle became a standalone don't ask, don't tell repeal bill. And Democrats had the majority, but they didn't have a filibuster proof majority. So we had to get to 60. So we knew that we had to get all these Democrats. That's why we went to Jim Webb's office. And we knew that we needed to get Republicans. And so we continued to make McCain and Lindsey Graham villains because we wanted to be able to move people like Murkowski and Snow and Collins, some moderate Republicans who we thought did, probably didn't want to be associated with the villainization. They want to be seen as pro-military. They're mildly okay with gay people, and they don't want to be that. And so that became one of our primary strategies. And we did a final White House arrest in which we had both veterans who had been kicked out of the military and civilians. The veterans were all in uniform, all branches represented, so that it was like 11 or 12 people who were arrested. And folks who were participating in the action the night before decided as a group that rather than walking away, being led away in handcuffs like they had done before, they would basically make the park police drag them away in handcuffs. So most people went limp when they were arrested. So again, we escalated the tactic, but also escalated the drama and confronted the American public with videos of veterans in uniform, in handcuffs, being dragged away from the White House fence, which helped put more pressure on the possibility of a standalone bill. Right. So again, playing your role as Get Equal, showing there's a lot of people that think this is incredibly urgent, are willing to do pretty dramatic things. And you don't have to wonder who those people are because they're in uniform. And so hopefully just building more and more support for your side. Generally in our society, people in uniform, military, the police have a lot of support. So can we show through activating the support they already have with a disruptive tactic, can we build more energy for our side. I'm assuming there are also inside game players who are trying to activate their networks and lobby and that kind of thing. But my understanding is there's a parallel strategy happening, which was trying to get Obama to take a more active stance because he had actually said, yes, repeal should happen. He made that statement in the State of the Union, but yes. is totally willing to give Secretary of Defense Gates, who he appointed or reappointed, the ball on when that was going to happen. And Gates had said, we're going to study the issue That's and right. we'll study it some more. And in December, we'll have a report. And you all continue to use this tactic in terms of trying to turn up the heat on him and say, that's not good enough. Obama shouldn't just say whenever the military wants to repeal itself, it should. 
but actually took it, my understanding is to his fundraisers and that became something that also got a lot of national news attention. Yeah, so the conventional wisdom in DC is that if you want to look like you're supporting something but actually slow it down, then you study it. And so that's exactly what Obama said to um, Secretary of Defense is, you know, hey, I want I want repeal to happen. What do we need to do? And again, you have to remember that Obama had never served in the military. And so he was very deferential to what the military advisors and Secretary of Defense were saying. And so the Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, said, OK, great, we'll put a study in the field. We'll survey active duty members of the military. We'll survey for some reason, their spouses. I don't know why they were surveying them. We'll survey all the people and we'll get those results back after the election. So you don't have to worry about this being an election issue. We'll get the results back after the election. We'll put out a report during the lame duck session so that nothing can happen. Like there's like two weeks between the the point when the report was due and the end of the lame duck session before the new Congress, which Republicans have the majority. For. And so, you know, I think there were two things that we were trying to do to intervene in that piece of the landscape. One was to continue to confront Obama directly, which made him very, very uncomfortable because he saw himself as a progressive. And so he was really uncomfortable when progressives were protesting him. And we also wanted to make the environment as chaotic as possible. Because if Gates's narrative was, we're going to do this in a really orderly way, it's going to be very, very predictable. Military cohesion will not suffer as a result, you know, of all these gay people in the foxholes all of a sudden. Then we wanted to disrupt that as well and make Gates uncomfortable. We were able to actually continue to disrupt Obama. We disrupted a fundraiser that he did with Barbara Boxer in California. It was really the first time that he had been confronted with this directly. And props to the folks who interrupted in that during that fundraiser because it was not comfortable at all, really scary to be in a room full of Obama supporters and Secret Service and have the courage to to make your voice heard and to confront, you know, this very, very powerful man in his own in his own space. Ironically, he was doing this fundraiser with Barbara Boxer, who was the senator from California and had actually introduced a bill to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, like 20 years before, 30 years before. So Obama actually, like when he realized that he was being disrupted because of Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal, he actually went over and asked her like, hey, how are you on repeal? Like, Did you vote for Don't Ask, Don't Tell? She said no. But what she didn't tell him was no, I've actually been trying to get this repealed for decades. So we continued to confront Obama directly. We weren't able to disrupt Gates. The Secretary of Defense doesn't do public events, really. So our tactics wouldn't really apply as well with Gates. But what actually ended up disrupting him is that people were filing lawsuits along the way. And this was I think maybe the only good thing that log cabin Republicans, the gay Republican group has ever done, that they filed a lawsuit that was then heard in a federal district court. And the judge said, yeah, no, this doesn't seem right. We should get rid of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And so that threw everything into chaos. Dan Choi went to the Times Square military recruiting office and said he was going to sign up for active duty again. All the reporters were all over it. And I think that's when that was happening in, I think, maybe October of 2010. And that's when Gates, I think, was like, whoa, actually, my plan of an orderly transition is not actually working. Reading about this to prepare for this interview, it looks like the federal judge passed a worldwide injunction on Don't Ask, Don't Tell, which what a great thing to be able to do a worldwide injunction. And so- Well, a worldwide injunction for the U.S. military. Sure, for the U.S. military, but everywhere now suddenly, yeah, it was totally fine for you to be openly gay. The military could not kick you out. So you guys have been trying to create chaos on the outside, have found moments to do that. This judge's order, thanks to all these lawsuits, way more chaos that 
actually Secretary Gates starts to move in the direction of, oh my God, we need to have repeal so we can control it. And so going yeah. into December, what happens? A couple of things. One other tactic that I really just think was really beautiful and would be remiss not to mention, and that also then comes up in November and December, is that Netroots Nation, big conference of progressive organizers that happens every summer. And that year, it was taking place in Las Vegas. So it was in Nevada. Harry Reid was the Democratic majority leader. He was a senator from Nevada. And so there were several of us who went to Netroots Nation, sort of just like to go to the conference. I had been going for years. And also sort of to sort of like see what organizing opportunities there might be there. We actually did an arrestable action for ENDA. We were still trying to push for ENDA. Again, Senate Majority Leader has a role in that and shut down Las Vegas Boulevard to try to get attention on ENDA. But the really beautiful action that we orchestrated was that Senator Reid was going to be interviewed on stage in a full in a plenary session at the conference. And so the night before that was happening, we reached out to the blogger who was interviewing him and were like, hey, can you relay a message to Senator Reid about Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal uh, or ask a question or whatever? And she said yes. So we were all in this giant ballroom. There were thousands of people, um, Senator Reid on stage with the interviewer, and she asked the question about Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal. And we had brought Dan Choi out to Vegas for the conference. We were all sitting at a table in the very front of the ballroom. And when she asked that question, Reed started to answer and Dan jumped up on stage. This is the Senate majority leader. He has security all over the place. Dan jumps up on stage, starts talking to him in the midst of this interview about Don't Ask, Don't Tell Repeal. And, you know, Reed is like, we're going to get it done. We're going to get it done. And Dan pulls his West Point ring out of his pocket. We had not planned this part. We had planned the disruption. We had not planned this part. Dan pulls his West, West Point ring out of his pocket and said, I'm going to give you this. And I want you to hold on to it and think about all the people who are impacted by this policy. I want you to take this as a token of your commitment to repealing this policy. Reed is freaked out. Like, what do you do? There's no good way out of this. I can't take the ring. I can't not take the ring. So he's saying like, that's such a prized possession. There's no way I can take it. Really pushing back. He does not want this ring. And Dan says, no, 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 take it. And when you repeal, don't ask, don't tell, I'll take it back. And so Reed consented to do that. And after the standalone bill passed, Dan went to Senator Reed's office to thank him for getting the bill passed. And Reed pulled the ring out of his desk drawer and gave it back to him. Yeah, so there's probably not a lot of suspense on what actually happened. But just to fill in some of the gaps, too, it sounds like Secretary Gates came out heavily for Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal in the lame duck session That's before right. the new Congress was sworn in because... He wasn't sure what would happen because he didn't want the chaos of this worldwide injunction. And so that's why the standalone bill, part of it, why it passed was he had so much influence across for Republicans and Democrats in terms of the Senate. And, uh, and so you all were able to claim that victory, even though I don't think we ever really said this, but like you guys wanted to win the Employment Non-Discrimination Act and you were fighting several fronts, fighting several campaigns and ended up just realizing at some point, if we, we can, we can maybe win Don't Ask, Don't Tell this year, it has the most bipartisan support or the most opportunities to exploit cracks in the Republicans coalition. And we'll try to come back to fight and another day, which again, also seems to parallel in a lot of ways in that same year in documented movements said, you know what? Comprehensive immigration reform is a goal. We want status for everyone. But this year, we think we could win if we separate off just protections from deportation for That's the right. youngest or the most innocent looking or the whatever, that we can win that. That's an important piece, Andrew, because what started happening over the course of the late summer and into the fall, again, as we were heading into midterms, everyone knew Democrats were going to lose Congress and that everyone was vying for some space to pass something in the lame duck session 
Don't Ask, Don't Tell and Dream started to get pitted against each other. And so all, all the Democrats were coming out saying, we can't possibly pass both of these. There's no way that we can pass both of them. Maybe we can pass one. And that was actually their way of saying, we don't want to do either of these things. <laughs> and so we're going to just let these folks fight against each other and not have to do either of them. I remember having just beautiful conversations with um, folks who have been organizing around Dream, especially Felipe Sosa Rodriguez, who I eventually then worked with at Get Equal, saying like, hey, we see, we see what's happening here. We've got to move both of our campaigns at the same time, and we have to back each other up. And so we put out joint statements. We were starting to do actions together. We were starting to message to our respective audiences. You know, there's crossover. There's tons of crossover between queers and undocumented folks. And we knew that we needed to do a ton of public education with both of those groups to make sure that we were showing up in solidarity and making sure that even if we weren't saying one or the other, that the communities also weren't saying one or the other. So we also did some internal organizing with our own community to make sure that we were trying to push back on that narrative. Which is interesting also because, so there were a ton of queer immigrant rights, young immigrant rights leaders, but mainstream immigrant rights organizations were definitely not making it a priority, even if some of them might have been out. And the same was in some ways true other way around in terms of mainstream LGBTQ organizations, not a lot of visible overlap, crossover or advocacy for undocumented people. And so you all as really both playing rebel roles in your respective movements, get equal over here. A lot of the queer organizations you mentioned and that were leading the Dream Act advocacy efforts were very much playing the outside game. We're trying to figure out how to how to get together on this and not let them exploit divisions. That's right. So this December 2010, Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal does pass. The DREAM Act gets a vote. It fails. Can you tell us more about what you think are especially insightful lessons for us today under this administration, in this political climate, 12 years later from this campaign that you think we should maybe absorb a little bit more, spend more time thinking about? The big lesson for me is the critical, critical importance of base-led organizations, base-building organizations being at the center of strategy and the importance of having folks in leadership of organizations who are either directly impacted by what, whatever the fight is, whatever the campaign is, or who are very clear about their accountability to that base. I think the real shakeup with this campaign is that for many years, for two decades, the repeal effort had been led primarily by lobbyists, by inside Beltway folk, career advocates, you know, who had lived in relative isolation from the impact of these policies, knew their importance for sure, but just weren't living the day-to-day -day impact. And so part of our work, a significant part of our work in 2010 was moving decision makers and moving the public. But we also had to organize, I think this is the big lesson, we had to organize within and sometimes against our own movement organizations. And that happened in really public ways. It happened in really private, quiet ways. You know, I've always said that the best version of Get Equal would have been to be in backroom conversation with HRC. And we actually tried to do that. I actually went to one of the vice presidents at, at HRC multiple times and was like, look, we actually can work an inside-outside strategy together. But in order to do that, we need to have this back-end conversation where we can be honest with each other and where we can work on strategy together. And that failed really miserably. It actually caused a lot of hurt because then 
HRC and went and told the White House what we were doing, which was super not helpful. The main lesson was that for me, it was a whole lot easier to make the strategic decisions that we made, knowing that A, I'm accountable to our base, and B, if I never get a job in DC again, it's actually a marker of success. And and C, had to be willing to be painted as the bad guy. In LGBTQ publications, lots of bloggers, lots of reporters were talking about how Get Equal was gonna sink the movement, some pretty shitty stuff. And we just had to be really, really focused on what our strategy was and really grounded in the impact it was going to have. We had to be willing to be the bad guy in order to get us across the finish line. So certainly I can see how if there was more dialogue across role, people playing the outside game, playing the inside game, you all saw a gap in the ecosystem and said, let's create this entity that can push in a really more aggressive way because no one else is doing that. And I'm wondering if there's anything in that vein or even the, the way that you all thought about, it's almost like you were testing, can we win and can we win over here? Can we win over here? And seeing that as we're going to win in stages one way or the other, we're not going to win everything we want all at once. If either of those things feels relevant, in what way would it be relevant today? My first reaction to that is that we had to be willing to launch campaigns and fail and then communicate to our base about that. I remember being on the phone with folks in our base from across the country telling them, end is not going to move. And it was a really upsetting phone call. (laughs) I was crying. Everyone else was crying. For a lot of folks who live in rural Texas or live in Mississippi in the same way that they had put hope in Barack Obama. They had put hope in our organization as well. To some degree, we were letting them down by saying that this campaign is just not going to work. And also we had the respect for our base to say this campaign isn't going to work. Here's everything that we're seeing. Here's the calculations that we're making. What are you seeing and feeling? Give us some feedback. If you see an opportunity that we're not seeing, there was a real back and forth. And we all came to the conclusion, even though we didn't want to, that ENDA wasn't going to move. I think part of the reason for that is that, you know, both Don't Ask, Don't Tell and employment discrimination, getting kicked out of the military, losing your job. No one wants to tell that story. (laughs) No one wants to talk about that publicly. Those are shameful things. And so we also, we hadn't done the public education that was necessary in order for the American public to even know that employment discrimination was a thing. I would spent so much time on, on, on the phone with reporters, convincing mainstream reporters that it was totally legal to fire someone because they were gay. And I remember talking to a reporter who was arguing with me and I was like, I promise you there is no federal protection here. That's where we learned a lot of lessons from the undocumented youth movement. They were wrestling with the same thing about how do you tell the story about a thing that the world has taught you to feel shame about? How do you shift that narrative? How do you shift that narrative for yourself? How do you shift it for the public? where you take this moment where either you're fired or you're kicked out or you learn you're undocumented and you you shift that into a moment of power. And we just needed more time to be able to do that. And over time, we did, right? In subsequent years, you know, Get Equal helped win an executive order banning employment discrimination by federal contractors. We haven't gotten a federal law passed yet. But 25 to 30% of all employers are federal contractors. We were able to make that progress and we were able to figure out ways to make those storytelling interventions. But I think that piece around the, the amount of time it takes to move our own community from a place of shame to power and then to move the American public in the same way, we didn't have enough time in 2010 but we have all, all the time in the world with other campaigns. Super helpful reflections. 
for us right now, I think. Well, I think we're at the end of this story and this phase and you, I think just nodded to, there's more to the story in the sense that Gen Equal didn't stop there. We often end just by stepping back a little bit and looking at where we're at left social justice movement, organizing landscape. And if there is another offering or a wish or something else that you'd like us to reflect on that could even be separate from the story you just told, what would it be? I think one of the impacts of living through and organizing in the Trump era was that we all got a lot of times by necessity, we all got a lot smaller. And sometimes we got smaller to protect ourselves in super real ways. Sometimes we got smaller because the American left isn't used to organizing under an authoritarian government. We're used to organizing in really hard circumstances, really unjust circumstances, white supremacist circumstances. But that was different. I think we learned a lot of lessons from the global left about what that looks and feels like. But I think that we're still all coming out of that. We have to be small sort of feeling. A, because Trump hasn't gone away. B, because Trumpism hasn't gone away and isn't new. I'm searching for the organizing right now that is, that's feeling big. Um, I'm super excited by what Nady is doing now with Unemployed Workers United. I'm super excited by the new labor organizing that's happening with Amazon unionization, Starbucks unionization. And I think that's similar to that moment in 2010 where there was a really big unorganized base of people who were begging for organizers to do more. I think that there is still a similarly big group of unorganized people who are asking us to do more, to be more, to be bigger. And I'm excited about that organizing. Thank you for sharing that, Heather. And thanks for being with us today on Craft of Campaigns. Really appreciate you. Yeah, thanks so much for asking. The Craft of Campaigns podcast is a project of the Organizing Skills Institute at Training for Change and made possible by grassroots donors. Visit Training for Change for workshops, training tools, and other resources. We welcome your feedback and nominations for other campaigns that should be featured on this podcast. If you like these episodes, please consider donating to keep the show running. This podcast is produced by Ali Roseberry-Polier. I'm Andrew Willis-Garces. See you next time.